Good evening. My name is Nick Coddington. I'm the Director of Education, Public Programs, and Visitor Services here at the National Archives, and I want to welcome you to your National Archives. 200 years ago this week, President James Monroe used his annual message to Congress to assert our nation's budding role as a dominant world power in the Western Hemisphere. Within that 34-page message, President Monroe offered a roadmap for what we now call the Monroe Doctrine, which called for three main principles. Separate spheres of influence for the Americas and Europe, non-colonization of Latin America by European powers, and non-intervention in internal European affairs by the United States. While they've evolved over the years, those principles remain at the heart of US foreign policy today. And like our founding documents here at the National Archives, we have preserved and protected Monroe's original address to Congress as one of the historical meaningful records that not only serve to guide us today, but help establish our national identity. If you get a chance, I hope you'll visit the rotunda and, visit the and be able to see the original Monroe Doctrine. It'll be on display until December 13th. I want to thank our partners, the James Monroe Museum, the James Monroe Highland, the University of Mary Washington Museums for bringing together this esteemed panel of scholars to delve into the history and the importance of the Monroe Doctrine for us tonight. I also want to thank the National Archives staff and the National Archives Foundation for their support this evening. And now it's my great pleasure to welcome Scott Harris, Executive Director of the University of Mary Washington Museums, and Sarah Bond Harper, Executive Director of James Monroe Highland, who will introduce our panel of scholars. Help me give them a warm round. Well, thank you and good evening. The James Monroe Museum, which is located in Fredericksburg, Virginia, is administered by the University of Mary Washington, and James Monroe's Highland, located just outside Charlottesville, Virginia, is owned by the College of William and Mary. I'm Scott Harris. It's my uh, privilege to lead the Monroe Museum, and my friend and colleague, Dr. Sarah Bon Harper, is Highland's executive director. Our institutions are grateful for the opportunity to collaborate with the National Archives and Records Administration to present tonight's program in this impressive venue. We're also grateful for financial support uh, provided by the Paul and Jane Jones Trust, which is administered by Walter J. Sheffield, the James Monroe Memorial Foundation, and the Friends of the James Monroe Museum. Their support makes our public programs possible. And we really must acknowledge the uh, tremendous work that Dorothy Doherty of the National uh, Archives, their virtual programs director, and Lindsay Crawford, our public programs coordinator at the James Monroe Museum, the work they did in putting this program together. They, they uh, spent a lot of time, logged a lot of hours getting us together and ready for this moment. We're very grateful for that. After our panel discussion, we will take questions from our audience here in the theater and online, and we welcome <coughs> both of those. President James Monroe's seventh annual message to Congress, which was conveyed on December 2nd, 1823, consists of 6,354 words. Approximately 1,000 of these words, appearing in several sections of the text, comprise the enduring foreign policy statement that bears Monroe's name. But the term Monroe, Monroe Doctrine did not come into common use until the 1840s when President James K. Polk dealt with the Mexican-American War and the Oregon boundary dispute with Great Britain. For the rest of the 19th century, the doctrine was referenced, often elastically, by subsequent administrations in several instances. The French invasion of Mexico in the 1860s, a territorial dispute with Great Britain known as the Venezuelan Crisis of 1895, and U.S. support of Cuban independence that led to the 1898 Spanish-American War. In 1904, President Theodore Roosevelt declared a corollary to the Monroe Doctrine that sanctioned intervention by the United States in the affairs of Latin America. And there are numerous other examples, big and small, where the doctrine has come into play, whether it's the Zimmerman telegram on the eve of the US entry into uh, the First World War, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and other instances. And from the mid-20th century to the present day, almost every U.S. president has had uh, a diplomatic, political, or military policy 
that has become synonymous with that president's name, increasingly applied not just to the Western Hemisphere, but globally. This evening, we will examine the origin, context, and application of the Monroe Doctrine over the last two centuries. We will also consider the doctrine's contemporary relevance and its implications for the future. That's a tall order, but we are fortunate to have a panel that is equal to the task, which Sarah will now introduce. Thank you, Scott. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce our panelists to those of you here in the audience and the many who are watching online. Um, first, we'll start with our uh, virtual panelist, Dr. Melissa Martinez, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and International Affairs at the University of Mary Washington. We welcome you, Melissa, um, whose research focuses on international relations and comparative politics with a particular focus on human rights and, non and violent non-state actors in Latin America. She is the author or co-author of articles in the journals International Studies Quarterly, Political Science Quarterly, P.S. Political Science and Politics, and Social Science Quarterly. Dr. Martinez teaches courses in U.S. Latin American relations, Latin American politics, and drug politics in Latin America. It's great to have you with us. Dr. Daniel Preston is an award-winning historian who began his professional career as an undergraduate intern right here at the National Archives from 1978 to 1979. He founded the Papers of James Monroe, an historical documents publication project in 1990, and served as, as its editor-in-chief for 30 years, retiring in 2020. He is currently co-editor of the Papers of Daniel Chester French, the American sculptor who created two of the great icons of the United States, the Minuteman statue in Concord, Mass., and the statue of Abraham Lincoln in the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. Welcome, Dan. Dr. Jay Sexton is Rich and Nancy Kinder Chair of Constitutional Democracy, Professor of History, and Director of the Kinder Institute at the University of Missouri. He is also a Distinguished Fellow of the Rothermer American Institute at the University of Oxford. Dr. Sexton is the author of seven books, including The Monroe Doctrine, Empire and Nation in 19th Century America, published in 2011. We're glad to have you. Dr. Ray Walzer is a professor of practice at Seton Hall University's School of Diplomacy and International Relations. He served as a foreign service officer from 1980 to 2007 in a wide variety of overseas locations, such as Nicaragua, Colombia, Mexico, Costa Rica, and South Africa, as well as the bureaus of African, European, and Western Hemisphere Affairs here in the U.S. From 2007 to 2013, he was a senior policy analyst for the Heritage Foundation, where he focused on political and security issues in Latin America. We're glad to have you here. Well, our first question is a lightning round. <laughs> and uh, it'll be for just uh, basic points, and then it'll get more uh, as we go along. Um, we'll start with Dan Preston, and then with Jay Sexton, uh, Melissa Martinez, and finally Ray Walser, going uh, in order with this question. What is the Monroe Doctrine? Dan Preston. Monroe Doctrine, as espoused by President Monroe in 1823, was an expression of concern that the European monarchies may make an attempt to suppress the republics in the Western Hemisphere and not so much warning them against doing it, but simply alerting the world that the United States would consider such action as being unfriendly and, and, and a threat. Jay. Okay, I see some students in the audience, so they'll know that the Monroe Doctrine is a trigger for PTSD from high school, <laughs> high school tests. That's probably how most people now encounter it. Um, you used to think that the Monroe Doctrine was like a script for America's foreign policy and its kind of plan to develop its power. I've changed my view over the years. Uh, my definition of the Monroe Doctrine is that it's a contested political symbol into which varying actors have loaded their agendas. So think of it kind of like an American flag lapel pin. <laughs> um, and I would just say one more thing in lightning round is that mm -hmm. it, it's not just Americans or those in the United States that have invoked the Monroe Doctrine. Indeed, some of the most important invocations, particularly in the last hundred years, have come from actors outside of the United States. 
Melissa Martinez, what is the Monroe Doctrine? Yeah, so the Monroe Doctrine um, was implemented at a time where Latin America was still very, very new, uh, gained independence quite recently. And so um, at this point, uh, the United States wanted Europe to stay out of, of a weak uh, a region in Latin America. Um, However, I, I also want to emphasize that the doctrine made it clear that it should not be interpreted as a desire to form uh, security interests or treaties in the region. Um, and it was from the very start a unilateral policy. Um, the U.S. was not necessarily interested in forming alliances coming from the doctrine and close ties with Latin American countries, but um, its main purpose was to focus on its own interest and unilateral approach. And Ray Walser. I, th I think we go back to the sort of the concept of the old world and the new world. And I think Monroe was attempting to what I would say carve out sort of American exceptionalism, a term we often use that we're the new nation, and sort of spread that, that, that mantle of exceptionalism that these new struggling independent states should be allowed, as we did, to continue their forward progress to pursue their own sort of manifest destiny, so to speak. So I see it as, uh, as I think every other point is well taken, but I think it, we're the exceptional nation. We're gonna show leadership in the hemisphere uh, and we're gonna support our, our fledgling brothers to the south. Well, now let's get into some discussion of these points. So now we've gotten the lightning round out of the way. And, and to Dan Preston, um, who has probably spent more time than anyone on the stage uh, researching, studying, pondering uh, the career of James Monroe, what did James Monroe say in the, the uh, annual address that, that we extracted to become the Monroe Doctrine? What prompted him to raise the issues that he raised? What did he hope to achieve? So what's, what's a brief summary of the genesis and statement of the doctrine? And as been alluded to in uh, the early part of the 19th century from roughly 1810 to 1820, a number of Spanish colonies in, in what we now refer to as South America, Latin America, what revolted against the colonial rule of Spain. And by 1820, a half a dozen so of them had pretty much achieved their independence. They had, they had expelled the Spanish from, from within their domains. This was followed in 1820 by a actual revolution in Spain in an effort to establish a constitutional government, not necessarily unseat the monarchy, but at least establish a representative uh, constitutional assembly to help govern the country. This movement in Spain was suppressed by an invasion of a large army from France with the backing of Austria, Prussia, Russia, and other allies of the Spanish monarchy. The British opposed this move into Spain and were concerned that if the monarchies, once they succeeded in Spain, would then continue their campaign and try to suppress the revolutions and return the rebellious colonies of, of South America back into Spanish control. And the British called on the U.S. to make a joint statement opposing any intervention by the European monarchies in, 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 in the Western Hemisphere. There was a lot of debate in the U.S among the leader, leadership uh, whether this proposal should be accepted or not. Monroe gradually moved away from it in favor of a more unilateral statement because he really wanted, as he thought about it, he wanted to say more about the role of the United States in this evolving world rather than just limit it to uh, this one specific event. When, when, when Monroe became president in 1817, there were two independent nations in the Western Hemisphere. In 1823, at the time of the, of, of, of the message, there were eight and more likely to come forth. So there was a rapidly evolving uh, change in, in the world uh, at the time. 
And the hope was in the United States that these new countries in South America would become republics like the United States. And Monroe's fear was that the European monarchies being adamantly controlled, uh, excuse me, adamantly opposed to uh, the spread of republicanism, which was a direct threat to monarchy, would indeed try to suppress these uh, revolutionary new governments and, by implication, threaten the United States, the United States being the seed of Republican government in the world. The United States in 1817, when Monroe became president, the only republic in, 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 in the Western world. So he decided to use his annual message to Congress, which was the equivalent, uh, today we refer to it as the State of the Union Address, but it was the major policy statement issued by the government each year. And everybody paid a lot of attention to it, so Monroe knew that if he said something in, this, in his message that it would receive a lot of attention and people would pay attention to it. Um, a lot of the message was, was, was standard uh, information given to Congress of uh, issues that Congress would be dealing with in the upcoming session. The uh, state of the Army, state of the Navy, internal improvements, the, 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 the national budget, these sorts of things. But part of the way through, he was talking about um, foreign relations, and he brought up the subject of a negotiation with Russia referring to uh, Russian interest in expanding its territory in, 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 in what is now the Pacific Northwest. And in talking about this and about the upcoming negotiations, Monroe said one of the points that the United States would emphasize in its negotiations is that all of the territory in the Western Hemisphere was either occupied by independent nations or were colonies of Europe, and there was no room for any more colonies to be established within the Western Hemisphere. This later became known as, as the, no, the non-colonization principle. Uh, this was off, and totally separate from, from whatever else became known as, as, as the Monroe Doctrine. Let me, let me jump in on this and ask about this too, because if one Googles the question, who wrote the Monroe Doctrine, more than a few responses say it was John Quincy Adams. And I know that there's nothing more likely to, to raise your ire than that, yeah, that fact. That's and about so it. between you and Jay, who maybe will moderate that hostile response about it, what about John Quincy Adams? What about his role? What about Monroe's role in articulating the statement? Monroe depended heavily on the advice of his friends and advisors. When he received the message from England about uh, the British proposal, he immediately wrote to his friends, his advisors, his close associates, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison said, what do you think about this? And got their opinions on it, wrote to others, and then began to discuss it in, in the cabinet meetings as well. Um, at that point, Monroe was moving away from a joint statement, thinking about an individual statement, and Adams more or less reinforced what he said, that the United States should make a unilateral statement and not, not do something in, in, in uh, conjunction with, 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 with Great Britain. Um, Adams envisioned the response to be a diplomatic note that he as Secretary of State would write to the, foreign, to, to, to the Secretaries of State, the foreign ministers of the various countries, explaining the U.S position on this, and if that had been the case, we had never heard of any of this. That would have been, it would have been a, a, you know, a few Adams scholars, a few uh, scholars of diplomatic history would have picked it up. Monroe, however, being a much better politician and understanding how better to relate to the public, put it in his annual message, which put it front and center out to the American public and to the rest of the world. Um, Adams wrote the short clause 
about non-colonization, about negotiations with Russia. Monroe used Adams' wording precisely, and I think this is why people pick up on this. Oh, Adams wrote this, and therefore he wrote everything else. Adams wrote about reform in the army. Adams wrote the part of the message about the budget. He wrote this part. You know, anyway, it's, it's a lot of whatever. So, um, Jay, is, is, Jay is, it, is it Monroe's doctrine? Um, oh, I don't, I don't know if it really matters a whole lot, I mean, in the grand scheme of things. I mean, one of the reasons why this debate has been so persistent, like who, who is the author of the Monroe Doctrine, is because one of the best sources we have for its genesis is actually John Quincy Adams' diary. And we know that the cabinet is discussing how to respond to the British offer, how to respond to this crisis over the course of uh, several weeks, six weeks, more than a month. And they're going back and forth, to toing and froing. And I think that what really matters about the message is to understand that, you know, rather than to say this guy deserves all the credit, is to say that it was a compromised document that was a product of these internal cabinet debates. And like most compromises, the critical issues were kicked down the road. So they could all agree, and they being in the cabinet, we've talked about President Monroe, Secretary of State John Quincy Adams, a Yankee um, from New England. The other big guy we haven't talked about is South Carolinian John C. Calhoun. And if you want to see difference in the cabinet, it's between Adams and Calhoun. Um, and I think implicit, maybe we can get to this later in Q&A, it's because one is from an increasingly pro-slavery state and one's becoming um, an anti-slavery politician from the North. And that's kind of lurking beneath their disagreements on how they understand national security. Uh, and that's what those debates are about. You might think about Monroe's role the way I think about it, like Eisenhower, the hidden hand president that's kind of <laughs> guiding a complex negotiation internal policy through to its end, and the end is Monroe's message. So that's the key point there. Two more things real quick. What, what issues do they fudge? And why does it matter? They fudge the issue of uh, what are they actually going to do to support the Latin Americans and also the Greeks, which is also yeah. part of this discussion. You know, they give support to them, rhetorical. But they're not prepared to actually do anything. And that question is <laughs> discussed, but there's no decision made about it. Uh, the British offer, they just kick that can down the road. They don't actually rule it out. Um, that comes back later after the message is delivered. There's no definitive answer on that. And then the real important question, which the Attorney General, William Wirt, says is the only important thing we've discussed and we really haven't answered, is what are they going to do if France actually deploys an army to South America um, and decides to intervene? There's no answer to any of those questions. So the key thing to know about Monroe's message of 1823 is that it tells Europeans what they can't do but it does not decide what the United States should do. That's why it's important. It's a blank canvas for subsequent generations, and they can deploy it on behalf of all kinds of diverse foreign policy projects because there's no kind of active policy embedded in the original message. But I would say what makes it uniquely Monrovian is when he gets to the meat of it, He talks about this implicit threat of invasion and how a threat to the new South American republics is a threat to the American republic. What Monroe was concerned about and what the others weren't so much was the defense of republicanism. And what's interesting is in 1792, 1793, at the time of the French Revolution, Monroe wrote a series of newspaper articles saying why the United States should, should support the French, and he said exactly the same thing. The European monarchies are going after the French Republic, and if they suppress the French Republic, they're going to go after the other revolutionary republic, which is us. And it's not, and, and as Jay points out, he doesn't say we should enter the war on the side of the France, we should, of France, we should do this, we should do that. It's simply an alert that he wants to issue to the American people. 
that this threat to this form of government, which was at the time uniquely American, may be under threat, and we better think about it and be prepared to deal with it. And we've got to jump on our time machine now and go to the early 20th century. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, so move way forward. One of the things, um, if you only know a couple facts about the Monroe Doctrine, you think about the Roosevelt Corollary. Um, so uh, proclaimed in 1904, uh, Jay, what did it say? What was the impact? Why does it matter? Okay, so this, now we're talking about the Theodore Roosevelt. We're not Franklin Roosevelt yet. We're, the, we're still a Theodore Roosevelt. I mean, Theodore Roosevelt had been a big advocate of American imperialism. There's a wonderful exhibit out there that was mentioned. Great cartoon of Uncle Sam standing at the fork in a road. One path goes to, it's called the Imperial Highway for imperialism. The other path goes to the Monroe Doctrine. The point is that in the late 19th century, the Monroe Doctrine was actually the symbol of anti-imperialists. It was those who opposed like America going to war with Spain in taking the Philippines and Cuba and Guam and Puerto Rico, which is, of course, exactly what happens in 1898 and is the program favored by Theodore Roosevelt. Now, he becomes, secretary, or he becomes president a few years later. He inherits some real crises in the Caribbean, one in particular in Santo Domingo, what we call today the Dominican Republic. He's concerned, just as Monroe was concerned in 1823, that this instability will trigger European intervention or colonization of Santo Domingo. And so Roosevelt issues his famous corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, which draws from the original of 1823, but has a fundamental difference to your question. The difference is he's now answering what will the United States do. He's not just telling the Europeans hands off. He's now saying in order to enforce this prohibition, the United States needs to take unilateral action. It needs to intervene in Santo Domingo. It needs to seize control of the customs houses so, to, it can, so the United States can repay the debts to European creditors. And then the United States needs to take a proactive role in administering rule and authority uh, on the island. Okay? That's the original Roosevelt corollary. It is then used in more than two dozen instances for the United States to intervene in various crisis points in Central America and the Caribbean over the next, uh, say, two decades or so. Okay, so the negatively framed message is now a call for unilateral intervention. Um, Melissa might want to come in on this in a second <laughs> because she was referring to it earlier. The one other thing I would say about why does this matter it matters because the United States now finds itself in a series of quagmires in its own sphere of influence that are deeply unpopular, that cost a lot of money, and don't seem to be leading to any strategic benefit for the United States. So if you want to know why isolationism becomes such a powerful force in America in the interwar period, one of the reasons is because of the Roosevelt Corollary uh, to the Monroe Doctrine, which fosters all these interventions. So I often tell the students, it's kind of like Iraq and Afghanistan in our lifetimes, and how that's fueled a resurgence of isolationism because of the costs of these interventions. So it really matters in teeing up what will become a big grand debate about the future of American foreign policy as the world enters those two great world wars in the, in the mid 20th century. And so I'll ask a, a quick follow-up, Matt, unless Melissa wants to add anything. Well, I, I, let's get to Melissa's question because it does play right okay. off of that and then maybe backtrack we'll come back. to the other one for you. Melissa, we have not forgotten you're there. We can see you and you're looking over our shoulder. So as Jay noted and, and, and Dan starting us off, from 1823 on, really through the 19th century into the early 20th, Latin America's vantage point of what the Monroe Doctrine means uh, evolved, we, uh, it's probably safe to say. Those former Spanish colonies were initially the beneficiary of this American statement and, and ultimately its power to be a shield against European interference. Uh, but over time, U.S. hegemony and intervention in the hemisphere has been increasingly resented in Latin America. So how does or does not the Monroe Doctrine influence U.S.-Latin American relations today? Yes, um, thank you, Scott. So 
Yeah, I mean, definitely times have changed since the implementation of the Monroe Doctrine. Um, now, it's hard to say whether the Monroe Doctrine alone influences U.S. Latin American relations today. Um, however, um, the Monroe Doctrine was just as uh, Jay mentioned earlier, right? A company with related uh, uh, policies or policies and actions that were not very uh, uh, supported, right? Um, that ultimately led to a series of violations of sovereignty uh, that keep um, uh, that that keep happening um, over time. Now, because of uh, these violations of of sovereignty, right? Um, over time, uh, we we tend to see a, a shift in what happens in uh, Latin American uh, in the Latin American region. Again, this is not something that happens uh, from one day to the next, um, but uh, we we start to see uh, multilateral approaches that keep the United States out. Um, of course, the U.S. has been involved in uh, multilateral organizations and um, you know. Uh, uh, trade agreements, um, uh, so organizations like the Organization of American States, right? Um, it was also part of the Rio Pact in uh, 1947 that I'm sure uh, uh, Ray might, uh, Jay might, might want to, uh, uh, you know, raise a point later. Um, but ultimately, later on, especially after the Cold War, um, there were a series of alliances and organizations that intentionally are meant to keep the United States out, which is uh, fairly interesting. And a lot of that, um, you know, is, is evolving from trying to step away from this um, unilateral uh, foreign policy that the United States had implemented, right? Um, so uh, some of these organizations that uh, come forward include the Bolivarian Alliance uh, for the Peoples of Our America, also known as ALBA, which is uh, a far left alliance that was uh, promoted by Cuba and Venezuela in 2001. Um, and one of the many objectives of ALBA uh, was to fight the uh, autonomy uh, of Latin America and oppose U.S. imperialism, right? Um, um, and then there are other more moderate uh, examples. Um, for example, the Union of South American Nations, also known as UNISUR, uh, which uh, formed in 2008. Um, and that one formed to promote uh, regional integration, which is still um, a topic of uh, today, um, is how to promote regional integration in, in the region. And a lot of this discussion is happening without the United States based on you know, experiences uh, from the past. Um, and um, one of the other um, organizations that um, has also been promoted um, is that largely stands out is the community of Latin American um, and Caribbean states, right, known as CELAC. Um, and this was built actually after much criticism of the Organization of American States because of the influence that the United States has. Now, what's interesting is um, uh, for, for many uh, strategic reasons back then when it was formed back in, I believe it was 1889, um, the, the ideas behind the Organization of American States was to include the United States, right, and uh, for the United States to have also um, uh, uh, um, uh, be part of the, of the discussion, right, of issues and disputes and, and have mutual objectives, right, that are promoted in the region. And so ultimately the headquarters are here, right, in the United States. Um, however, that also comes with many dilemmas for Latin America. That means that if the United States does not want Cuba, Latin America, uh, Nicaragua, right, or other far left um, uh, governments, then it can keep them out, right? So it, it can keep them out from summits. Um, and, you know, ultimately what happened, for example, last year in 2022 uh, was after, um, uh, you know, there was a, a large criticism, right, over uh, Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba. And um, there was a uh, discussion from the United States, uh, Vice President uh, Biden, right, not to include these countries. The uh, region reacted by uh, well, some of the members of, of Organization of America States reacted by not going to the summit, right? So um, in, in many ways, um, they have 
been able to recognize that although they do not agree with all objectives, they uh, obviously do not also all have congruent ideologies, right, or even political and economic objectives, uh, but they have found that there are some objectives that, and that there are, uh, there is power in numbers, especially when they are faced with a very powerful uh, hegemon, right, which is the United States. And uh, part of the big reason for the uh, creation of CELAC, right, had to do with that criticism of the organization of American states. So, um, and, and I say this because one of the central ideas behind the Monroe Doctrine was, it, was its unilateral <coughs> approach to state level and regional crises. And so the alliances and organizations that have formed, right, are a few examples that support the idea that the Latin American uh, region has, has moved forward from uh, a hegemonic unilateral foreign policy and really started to, to build um, other uh, uh, alliances, organizations, and, and trade pacts to support their mutual interests. Thank you. Um, really glad to have that. Um, and so let me follow up uh, maybe um, for Ray and or Melissa. Um, the rise of communism in the 20th century in Russia, Eastern Europe, Asia, and Latin America has profound implications on the foreign policy of the United States. And what role uh, or roles did the Monroe Doctrine play in our country's response to communism, particularly in Latin America? Well, <laughs> The document itself, I, I'm not sure whether the architects of foreign policy from the late 1940s on, uh, I think it, it contained basically what I'd call sort of three basic principles or sort of pillars. One is this, the geostrategic pillar, which is, again, that old world, new world. There are differences between the two. But then you add in another dimension, which is the democracy totalitarianism, or we went back sort of republicanism, monarchism. Uh, and then there's the economic system, which is capitalism versus communism. So obviously not all of that was included in the original Monroe Doctrine, but I think the idea of the distinctions uh, between uh, the two worlds, the defense of democracy, and the defense of our own security. Uh, I being a product of, I was thinking of these students. Anybody know what the term duck and cover means? Somebody <laughs> shouted out, what's duck and cover? Get under your desk. <laughs> cover, cover that your was not a student, and, by the way. <laughs> OK, and, and get ready for that atomic bomb. I mean, in essence, I, as I, I got a chance to sort of get this question in advance. And I think we sort of see three waves of fear of, of communism. First of all is the 1947 descending of the Iron Curtain, Mao takes over in China, uh, things are, we go into a sort of a panic, but we also begin to construct things such as Melissa said, the organi we reorganize the Pan-American system to become the Organization of American States. We create the, the Rio Treaty. We begin security assistance in the Western Hemisphere. I think there were .4 programs or something like that. Uh, we add a new tool to our armament, which is called the Central Intelligence Agency. So we begin, so the 1950s see a positioning of fear of the communist threat leads to such things as 1954 and the overthrow of Arbenz in Guatemala. Perhaps he was an indigenous left-leaning social revolutionary, but he had the fingerprints of Moscow were supposedly on it. So we got it rid of him pretty cheaply. Then something happens in 1959, which is sort of second wave, uh, and that's Fidel. And Fidel comes to power, and within three years, has become an ally of Moscow. And this really, remember we have a young president, John F. Kennedy, he's just been humiliated at the, at the Bay of Pigs. He was humiliated, I think, in, in uh, he was humiliated in, what was it, where he met with, Khrushchev and after the U-2 and oh, the, everything the like Vienna that. The Vienna Summit. Yeah, the Vienna mm -hmm. Summit and everything like that. So he's coming at it. He's building the things like the Alliance for Progress, but he's also uh, going after Cuba. We have the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. He invokes the Monroe Doctrine in the lead up to and says, you know, we're not going to allow the Soviets in the Western Hemisphere. So we fence along with that. 
the 70s, we have the interventions in Chile, and then we have kind of a Carter pause when he makes this famous speech, well, we shouldn't have the inordinate fear of communism, that we should really start thinking about who our so-called friends are in the neighborhood. The Argentines with their dirty wars, Chile with Pinochet and everything like that, this sort of moral stepping back. And then comes Nicaragua, uh, my first post in the Foreign Service one year after the Sandinista Revolution. Uh, all of a sudden, not only do we have Cuba, Moscow, we now have that beachhead on the isthmus with Sandinista as Sandinistas as the launching point for the destabilizing of Central America. So round number three occurs. Reagan doctrine, support for the Contras, Iran Contra and all that sort of stuff. Finally, something happens. What happens in, in 1988? It was 89, 89. What happens in 89? The Berlin Wall falls. Peace comes to Escapulas, comes to Central America. All of a sudden, the temperature, the air goes out. So the communist threat sort of, as I said, I think came in kind of three basic waves, and then all of a sudden, it just sort of fades away, but Cuba won't go away. It'll still be there. We can maybe talk about that later, but <laughs> that is, in my sort of snapshot view, the, uh, the, th the influence of communism. There's a, there's a beef up flip under Chavez, Alba, that she's talking about, uh, Chavez linkage with Iran and, and the like, but uh, then that's, that's uh, but, but communism per se is no longer a driving force in the hemisphere. Melissa, you have a, a take on, on that, that summary that uh, Ray has done? Yeah, I, I uh, thank you, um, and thank you, Ray, for that. I, I would just want, uh, want to add that um, I mean, during the Cold War, it wasn't necessarily, um, at least at the very beginning of the Cold War, it wasn't, um, uh, you know, the view that the United States had towards Latin America um, uh, at, since the Monroe Doctrine had been very paternalistic, right? So initially, the way to get, um, make sure that communism does not get into the region was thought, well, we just need to keep um, the Soviet Union out, right? Um, those, those communists out. Um, so it, it wasn't until um, really the, the, the Cuban Revolution, um, or you can argue that it was uh, during uh, Nixon's visit in, in Venezuela, um, that there became to, to to be alarm bells that perhaps, right, uh, communism could emerge from within the Latin American uh, uh, states. And so the approach that the United States took towards communism in the region um, then changed um, and along with their particular approach. Um, and in some cases, it was highly um, overt. In other cases, it was covert. And so um, I would, you know, was how much did the Monroe um, doctrine influence these? Um, perhaps uh, I would, you know, I would argue that in those covert instances, right? Um, and I, you know, for the very beginning or initially, especially in the planning of overthrow of Jacobo Advance, um, it was highly covert. Um, so it wasn't, you know, we, you know, we really need to keep communism out. That really happened a bit later on, right before he was ousted. Um, and so it, it's interesting, you know, when this this is used, right, of of, of having this um, policy of, of keeping communism out, um, and then the the, the tactics yeah. that the United States uses, whether it's overt or covert. And I think. Um, you know, if we want to make those particular connections, um, it makes more sense to use them when it's um, largely yeah. over. Well, uh, can I jump in here real yeah. quick? Um, the, when we're talking about the era of the Cold War and the Monroe Doctrine, there's a really interesting paradox. On the one hand, this is the period in time in which uh, the doctrine becomes kind of part of the American pantheon. It's <laughs> becomes <laughs> noted by everyone. Poor school kids are traumatized by <laughs> their uh, tests on the Monroe Doctrine. Commemorative coins are in circulation, etc. So its cultural standing has never been higher than during the days of the Cold War. Yet it's completely out of step with American 
geopolitics and grand strategy. I mean, the Monroe Doctrine, though it was an amorphous thing, at heart, as we heard, is about separating the globe into spheres of influences. That's not post-1945 America with <laughs> occupying armies in Eurasia, with plans throughout Latin America, with leadership of new international institutions like the UN, like the Bretton Woods system, and so forth. You know, that's the antithesis of the Monroe Doctrine. So actually, if you want to see who's really talking about the Monroe Doctrine in this period of time, you'd either find Latin Americans <laughs> who are saying, hey, you intervening in our country is not the true, <laughs> not the true Monroe Doctrine, or you would look for those old timers, those old timers that were opposed to uh, the UN or to NATO or to all these new global commitments, and they imagined the Monroe Doctrine as like a, a guidebook from a simpler time when America could kind of cocoon itself off in the wider world. So that's the sort of paradox. The last point to say about post-1945 America and the Monroe Doctrine, and it's still with us today, a fundamental kind of problem is that if America really wants to have a Monroe Doctrine, which means it can have its own sphere of influence, and it has certain privileges and responsibilities, uh, imperial duties, if it wants to say it can do that, well, then Russia, or the Soviet Union, can have its own sphere of influence. That's the Brezhnev Doctrine. You know, if there's ferment in Eastern Europe, roll in the Soviet tanks. Or China today. China can have its own Monroe Doctrine if we're going to talk about reviving the Monroe Doctrine in the 21st century. So it's this fundamental paradox, and that's why when America had a global grand strategy, the Monroe Doctrine was not a useful instrument, um, even if it was a powerful symbol of cultural yeah. nationalism. I mean, one of the lines is the non-intervention in European affairs. And right there, yes. we're intervening in the affairs, global affairs around the world. So there is, as I said, I totally agree with you of this paradox that, uh, that exists. Or something we mentioned earlier, you were talking about at uh, the negotiations at the end of World War I and how they were evoking the Monroe Doctrine, whereas U.S. intervention in World War I was a direct contradiction <laughs> yeah. of the Monroe yeah. Doctrine, yeah. which said the United States will not interfere in European affairs. Yeah. So, and yeah, an older historical paradox is, I, mean, I, I hesitate to say it, but Monroe almost had a Cold War mentality, an us versus them of, of, of opposing ideologies. But what's, what's curious about it is in Monroe's day, I'll get in trouble for saying this. The U.S. was playing the role that the communists played later of where they were the revolutionary viewed as the stabilizing element in the established world of monarchy. Uh, you know, and it's the, That's what I'm pointing out. Dan yeah. is retired now. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. He yeah, can yeah. say that? I am not, I am not yes. The no, views right. expressed right. by this panel exactly. do not necessarily reflect. Right. Well. And that was the ideological revolution. That was the new yeah. thought. And that, yeah. that was yeah. the role of Republicanism. Napoleon had a little bit to do with Exactly, that. yes. <laughs> Where, um, yeah. The European monarchies, their policy was essentially a policy of containment, to contain yeah. the contagion of yeah. Republican revolutionism. Yes. Um, so yes, it does, it does, it does work matter. that way. And it's also the pairing of security with ideology. Yeah. Like so, that, that's what the Monroe Doctrine of 1823 is about. That's also what the yeah, subsequent that's what I started yeah, Cold off. War, exactly what you said. Let me insert a point of order. This has been marvelous. We have 10 minutes left I, to get us more into contemporary times. And we have two questions, Sarah first, then me, yeah, that will bring so us more out of history into today. I think I but, want to like, pick on one thread there, mentioning China. Right. right? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we talk about ideology and security. We can also talk about economics and um, political um, approach, right? Recognizing that um, you know these aren't 100% the same thing. But um, talk about China. Talk about China's sphere of influence now in Latin America. Um, what kind of policy do we need? Is it economic? Is it political? Let's go to maybe Melissa yeah. first to be able to then bounce it back to this. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'll start with uh, I think three main um, points where. Uh, China has increased its influence in the region. Um, so the first one is not only has it expanded trade relations with Latin America, but it has also expanded investment interests uh, that are uh, many have argued are accompanied with high costs. 
Um, so China has slowly been able to uh, create closer ties in the region, um, ultimately because it has reached a mutual point of interest, and that is uh, development uh, without providing uh, political commitments. And so um, that's, that's the first uh, place where it has increased. Um, and so one of them is the very uh, perhaps well-known uh, to the students in the audience is the Belt and Road Initiative. And so currently, <clears throat> excuse me, there are 21 Latin American countries um, that are all part of the Belt and Road Initiative. And so although this is an economics, right, and investment, and it's not about security, um, some that criticize um, the Belt and Road Initiative, especially in the Western Hemisphere, right, is the debate that, well, China tends to contain uh, clauses that retain uh, the right to demand payments at any time. And uh, some argue that, you know, if they're unable to pay and China takes over control over their assets, uh, then it can also have leverage over international policy, right? Um, and even uh, a political policy. So, so that has been one of, of the main arguments there in terms of, of Chinese influence in investments. Um, that's one point. The, the second uh, point of, of influence is uh, a military contribution. So China has increased its military contributions in Latin America. Uh, this includes Venezuela, Argentina, Peru, Bolivia, Ecuador. Um, and so that's a, that's a second uh, a point, right, where we have seen an increasing um, influence here uh, from China. And the third indicator, I would argue, that um, is an indicator that China is gaining influence in the region is that there are more countries now that recognize China's claim over Taiwan. Um, so currently over only seven countries uh, recognize Taiwan. And so that, you know, that, that speaks right to one of the uh, political influences that, that China has been able to promote in the region, if, if nothing else. Um, and so I, I would argue that those are the three main, main points of influence in the region. Now, I also want to mention that the United States is still, you know, one of Latin Americans, uh, not one of, right? It's still the top trade partner um, in many places in the region. And so it has been able to create trade agreements and, um, and also China tends to stay away from uh, a political influence. And so although there has been an increasing um, a level of influence, of Chinese influence in the region, uh, the United States still has a, a good leverage of influence in, in the region. The only Ray, Ray is the diplomat, I was going to okay. say, and, and, and let me segue into my one that follows, that as, as we look at both the China influence, we've also got Secretary of State John Kerry in 2013 saying, yeah, the Monroe Doctrine is over. Five years later, Rex Tillerson says it's as important today as it was when it was written. How do you reconcile those things in both politics and diplomacy with China and all the rest going okay, on? Okay, well, let me add just a, a sort a of a final one. point yeah. on, on China's influence when you think of, of really sort of seeing, again, the sort of the tectonics with the BRICS, particularly the war in Ukraine, uh, the emergence of what one calls the sort of the global south, which would be sort of your anti-Monroe doctrine uh, uh, writ large, uh, which just recently added Iran, for example, to, uh, to the BRICS. So it, China is definitely throwing its diplomatic weight around, and I think your other three points are very trade, uh, security assistance, and Taiwan. So I totally agree with that. Uh, yes, back in 2013, I actually was sitting in the uh, big chambers of the big ballroom of the Organization of American States when uh, John Kerry pronounced the Monroe Doctrine dead. And it was kind of like, huh? <laughs> we really all thought it was dead long ago. And he says, oh, that's a big deal, isn't it? Okay, we start clapping and everything like that. Move forward to Tillerson, who makes a statement, uh, apparently in Austin, Texas, saying, yes, it's very much alive and well. Take, I see the Monroe Doctrine as kind of like an overcoat. When it's chilly, you put it on. Uh, you know, when the winds are blowing, the security winds and everything like that are blowing, you put the damned overcoat on. Uh, pardon my profanity. Well, it warms up. Relations are good. <laughs> you know, there's peace on earth and everything. You take the overcoat off. The Monroe Doctrine goes yeah. back on the shelf. Uh, 2013, the world was kind of going our way. Um, 
There was no Crimea. Uh, I mean, there were plenty of problems, uh, but the world was sort of going our way. 2018, America first, uh, a whole new sort of uh, attitude towards the hemisphere. As one of my uh, a colleagues said, well, you know, the Monroe Doctrine was initially there to keep the Europeans out, and now most Americans want a wall to keep the South Americans out. So, so we, the context completely changed. Tillerson brings it back in. It's, it, it's brought out, I think, as Jay said, uh, periodically, uh, and, it, and I think it's that sort of masculinity. Uh, it's a sledgehammer with which you beat yeah. your opponent with. Uh, so Tillerson brought it back into the, into the conversation. I think Biden has toned it down again. Uh, he wants to. Uh, well, it's, it's definitely appeared, and if you're watching the 2024 Republican primaries, we've had DeSantis, Ramaswamy, Pence, um, gives their foreign policy speeches, endorse the Monroe Doctrine. There's been a new um, uh, joint declaration or declaration from the a report from the Senate Foreign Relations Committee uh, expressing allegiance to this old symbol from the days of sailing boats and so forth. I think there's two things going on. First, it just fits into our contemporary political moment. Kerry, the Democrat, is canceling canceling a revered <laughs> national tradition, declaring it dead. Republicans, you know, putting it on like a cloak. And it's like it mirrors the 1619 versus 1776 thing in the way history is politicized. I think that's the kind of surface level thing. The real thing that's going on here, though, the real thing is that nexus between rapid geopolitical change in the world, which we just heard about, and then a new domestic dynamic where Americans are debating, what is our role in the world? What do we want to do? Do we really want to spend money to protect the Taiwanese and the Ukrainians? We'd rather spend that money building a border wall. What should we do? What's the future direction? And if you look at those moments in the past when the Monroe Doctrine has appeared in public discourse, it's when the world is in flux and Americans are internally divided about what they want to do and what their role is. So therefore, I really think that the Monroe Doctrine is you know, gonna be something that's around with us uh, for the foreseeable future, like it or not. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, let's um, hop right to then. I think that's the starting point of um, maybe our wrapping up lightning round before we go to audience questions and virtual questions then from our audience online. Um, let's see, Ray, do you wanna uh, take this first? On its 200th birthday, does the Monroe Doctrine still matter? Excuse me? Um, this is our lightning round <laughs> to wrap up. On its 200th birthday, does the Monroe Doctrine still matter? I can't, I can't displace what Jay said. It, it, yeah. it does matter. It is, it is alive just as 1776 is alive, 1619 project, you know, it is part of our historical fabric uh, and I think uh, at least the memory of it. But remember, it's just one component. It doesn't deal with AI, cybersecurity, mm. uh, global warming, all the other sorts of things of which you know, those chaps with maps, uh, you know, had no inkling that was coming down the road. So, yes, it's, it's very important, but there are so many other things out there uh, that are challenges in addition to what Monroe talked about. Thanks. Melissa? Um, yeah, so if it matters, I agree with Jay. It's going to depend on who you ask, right? Um, and so I, I think that unilateral focus, though, um, it's time to really step away from that. And so um, the region now looks differently. It has many countries with uh, strong political institutions and experience with uh, democratic governments. And so um, I think it's time that we consider mutual political and economic interests in the region and use that as an opportunity to tie our ties uh, with the region instead of of, of this continued unilateral approach towards the region. Thanks. Dan? I think what, what, what Jay says pretty much uh, sums it up. The, the idea of the Monroe Doctrine has taken on a life of its own, and it has come to mean whatever who is espousing it wants it to mean. And it, can, <laughs> it gets interpreted in, in so many different ways, but the name is there and the basic concept is there. 
and as long as people find it useful for whatever reason they're going to use it. Have events like this. <laughs> Jay, you said it was a symbol from the days of sailing ships. Anything else you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I'll happily bet anyone. I think that there'll be more uh, invocations of Monroe Doctrine in American politics 10 years from now than there were this year. A uh, second bet, more importantly, we didn't talk much about this, but I also predict that there'll be more invocations of foreign Monroe Doctrines. Um, that's what we didn't talk about. But China's nine-dash line, where it's kind of charting its sphere of influence and contested South China Sea waters, that's like its own Monroe Doctrine. The invasion of Ukraine, the Putin Doctrine, um, is a version of that. So I think that's the other place to look, and we'll also see that being an important factor. What you're saying is he so. should have trademarked it. <laughs> Good point, <laughs> yes. Patented it. Yeah. Yes, exactly. All right, well, thank you. Um, I think we've got questions on each side, right? Okay. So do you want to start there? You have a question from somebody online, Lindsay. Yes. Um, so this is from Phil Ander. Uh, it's a question for Melissa specifically, um, and people can weigh in. Um, Melissa, how did the doctrine reflect the foreign policy goals of the U.S. during the early 19th century, and what were its long-term impacts on U.S. relations with Latin American countries? I'm sorry, Lindsay. Can you repeat the first part again for me? How did the doctrine reflect the foreign policy goals of the U.S. during the early 19th century, and what were the long-term impacts on U.S. relations with Latin American countries? Um, so I, I think uh, perhaps uh, Jay and, and Dan can, can hit in more of, of U.S. Um, impacts in the early uh, 19th century, um, but ultimately um, in the how uh, the, the doctrine has affected um, the future. I mean, like others have said, right, it's, it's, a, it's a document that continues to be, um, it, it, you know, coming back and going, but it's not a policy. So um, although some uh, uh, political, um, you know, actors have brought it back, and mentioned the you know the Monroe Doctrine is back in, or uh, where we got rid of the Monroe Doctrine. Um, ultimately, though, I think what that says to the to the Latin American region, right, um, is there's no there's no stability, right, uh, in terms of whether or not the United States or how the United States really feels about the region, whether it has abandoned the Monroe Doctrine or it has not. And I just want to emphasize my point in terms of how um, organizations right, um, have adjusted to this uh, instability of, of you know, whether or not it's brought back in um, and uh, experience with the United States by creating their own um, alliances. So it, it's going to you know, continue to be discussed in, in political platforms here in the United States, um, but it's going to remain this unilateral uh, uh, document. Okay. Question here. Yeah, I know we're here for the course of the 200th anniversary of uh, the Monroe Doctrine, but of course, you know, I teach history as well, and I would uh, hazard a, a, a bet, I'd probably bet 100 bucks that most of my students wouldn't know what the Rio Pact of 1947 was or wouldn't be relevant. But in a way, isn't it a better model, perhaps, for multilateral approach to South America in particular? Would that be a, if you were to contrast it with the Monroe Doctrine? We know we're going to have the Monroe Doctrine. It's not going to disappear. But would that be a better roadmap, per se? Let me take one, if I could take a shot at that one. For th I think that we have two, I always use the, when I'm sort of teaching the thing, there's sort of two paradigms. There is sort of the Monroe Doctrine, which is the unilateral declaration, uh, which is, if you go back to, I pulled up an old article by Abraham Lowenthal, the hegemonic, hegemonic presumption of the Monroe Doctrine. On the other hand, remember there is that other strand. It's this kind of yin and yang, which is, uh, Pan-Americanism, uh, you know, inter-American dialogue and everything like that, the con concept of the OAS, the Democratic Charter. There is that other, other side, good neighbor policy. That's the other sort of paradigm, and, and we're constantly, as you said, sort of warring about it. I think you made that point. 
you know, Kerry the Democrat, you know, the, the Dove and, and, and Tillerson the hawkish Republican and everything like that. But we, we do gravitate between the two, the two paradigms. And, and they're both, <laughs> sometimes we have trouble uh, walking and, and chewing gum at the same time. It's such a great question, though, because everyone, the students will know the Monroe Doctrine, but they won't know the Rio Pact. I'll give you another version of it. They will know George Washington's farewell address, but they will not know Harry Truman's farewell address of 1953, the most underappreciated presidential speech, like, ever. And it's the inverse of George Washington when he's saying, you know, um, you know, no political binding political connections. Harry Truman's making a folksy case for internationalism in that same era. Of course, it's his administration that negotiates the Rio Pact, NATO, all that sort of stuff. So the big question is, why is it that the internationalism has lost such legitimacy? Why don't people understand how well it served America's interests? And I think that's a big, massive question that deals with economics deals with foreign policy, but it also deals with education. So I'm delighted to hear that you teach your students the Rio <laughs> Pact. <laughs> oh, I see. She, I thought she had a question. They're recording. Good evening. Thank you for coming here tonight. You know, uh, I really loved hearing uh, your just your wisdom and uh, all of your experience you guys have in this field. My question was particularly for the Monroe Doctrine. You said has come and has gone at times when it was convenient to our foreign policy. The Roosevelt Corley, on the other hand, has that something that has come and gone, or is that something that remains in the American consciousness? And is that something that we will see again come back, or is it something that has essentially left the arena in our toolbox? It's definitely the jack in the box. It had, its, it had its time. I mean, there was an internal State Department memo, Clark memo, which kind of reviewed the Roosevelt corollary and all the interventions and said, wait, this was a mistake. Uh, the Monroe Doctrine actually never said that we were supposed to do this and provided cover. And then, of course, it's Franklin Roosevelt who not only withdraws from these interventions but formulates the good neighbor policy, which is the precursor to the Rio Pact. So it's not still like operational with us today, but that idea absolutely is, absolutely is. And that's, I guess, one of the questions for, I guess for all you guys, not for us old timers up here, but for the next generation <laughs> to decide is, you know, what's the appropriate foreign policy answers? Because the instability and the insecurity that comes with it, those are real questions. It's not like it's an easy thing to just say, oh, let's just have a multilateral agreement and that'll solve all the problems. I mean, these are real problems but the course of action is very much up for grabs. Jay, can I make a, an additional comment on that? And, and if I think if I remember the corollary, it talks about sort of police action. Yep. And remember the little thing called the, drug, the war on drugs, uh, Plan Columbia, uh, use of sanctions and everything like that. Uh, we do engage in substantial police actions in this hemisphere. It's not necessarily against you know, the Spaniards returning and everything like that, but there is still that, that policing aspect uh, going after transnational criminal. I spent far more time at the State Department worrying about trans uh, transnational criminal organizations and being in Bogota in 1984 when Pablo Escobar is rising than I did worrying about the Monroe Doctrine. But uh, uh, I think that the police power, law and order, stability in the region, is, is still very critical, and I think that is still sort of at the root of, of the, the Roosevelt corollary. You, may, yeah, you, you mentioned um, it, with the Roosevelt corollary, the intervention in, 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 in the Dominican Republic. Was it evoked again when the U.S. again went into the Dominican Republic in the early 60s? 60. Or was that just sort of something that was separate and they never really no, talked about, was... they never put a, an, an <laughs> ideological label on it. They just did it. We just did it. Well, it was to prevent, uh, it was 65 to prevent uh, the Dominican Republic from going leftist, from becoming another Cuba. Uh, and it, you know, Johnson wasn't going to, to, to allow uh, 
you know, another Cuba to occur on his watch. But, but did they evoke any I, sort of uh, ideological label for it, or was it just simply uh, an expediency I, of, of, of the moment, as, as, as yeah, you're suggesting I, for Johnson? The little I remember, I'm not sure that it was mentioned, but I, you know, it was clearly another Cuba means another foreign, you know, another base, the, the Soviets sure. will exploit it and everything like that. So there, the logic was underlying it. Yeah. I mean, this is, again, the era of the Cold War is when presidents stop issuing corollaries to the Monroe <laughs> Doctrine and start issuing their own. Yeah. I mean, Truman's the first to do that. And it really is because of this sphere of influence problem that, that you know, it might be a classic Roosevelt corollary action to intervene in, in Dominican Republic in the 1960s, but you mustn't frame it as such because then that gives license for the Russians to do the same in, in Czechoslovakia. I have to note that in the collection of the James Monroe Museum, there is a political cartoon that shows a very beleaguered Lyndon Johnson looking at a portrait of James Monroe saying, they don't seem to like it as much as when you were in office. You know? <laughs> so there, at least Johnson, through that cartoon, was invoking a little bit of the, the tradition of it. Um, I was checking to see whether we have any other online question pending. Do we have another question here? We do. Yes, sir, go ahead. Uh, I haven't heard much mention about the influence of uh, the growing private business entrance and uh, interest in maintaining their investments, whatever, in particularly in, in South America. And my sense is that the Monroe Doctrine is invoked whenever those interests are threatened, justifying intervention. Or is there anything? developing where international cor corporations principally based from the United States are influencing our foreign policy to protect their interest and as opposed to protecting Republican government. So, Melissa, you're teaching uh, <laughs> courses about the region these days. Is this a topic that, that uh, yeah, I can, I can take on this, this particular question if I understand it correctly. Um, so if I understand it correctly, so are there any um, uh, policies that protect the Latin American states from um, investors from the, coming from the United States? Um, is, is that, uh, I think, if, if that's the question. Um, the, the answer to that is... Um, it depends um, on the government, and that's the other thing too that we didn't discuss, right? Is that um, you know, with Latin America, um, things have really changed. So there's there's also you know the emergence of the pink tide, right? Where you have these, and where it comes and goes, where you have uh, the emergence of new um, uh, left leaning uh, governments that implement their own policies that. Um, you know, have, have shifted and provide more protections, right? Um, uh, that uh, national protections um, in the region that might uh, uh, influence, you know, investors. Um, and then you have other um, other governments that are more um, invested in those particular investments and bringing uh, investment opportunities to their countries and promoted ec economic growth and promoting development in their in their governments. Um, and you know those particular governments would not not have high restrictions, um, you know, for these uh, particular investors. I mean, um, you, you know, you have countries like Mexico, um, depending on who's in administration, Brazil, right? Um, you also have, again, depending on whose administration, um, in the past, uh, Argentina. And so you have some governments that do want to promote these uh, particular investment opportunities. Um, and then there's others like uh, Bolivia under Evo Morales, um, definitely Venezuela under Hugo Chavez and Maduro, right? Um, it, that want to uh, have stricter protections of, of um, external um, investors or um, and, and particularly those coming from the United States. I want to say that. If I might add something I, to this, I, I think your point is, I think corporate interests had greater, you know, the 20s, the dollar diplomacy, 
United Fruit Company was seen to be behind the Arbenz screw. Uh, you know, corporate interest, the, you know, the power elite was much more integrated. Today, things are much more, you know, 1960, expropriation of US properties triggers the embargo in, in Cuba. Uh, on the other hand, in, in the 1930s, we managed to accept the nationalization of the oil industry in Mexico, part of the good neighbor policy and everything like that. Today, corporate interests don't wield the same sort of power that they, that they used to. We have investment disputes, trade disputes, and everything like that. But yeah, private economic interest in a market capitalist system, uh, in an oftentimes socialist-oriented uh, hemisphere, uh, still, still clash. We, we need to uh, bring this wonderful discussion, which could have filled an entire day, uh, or more to a close uh, with thanks. If there are questions that people have either online or here, you're certainly encouraged to go to the websites or the Facebook pages, for instance, of James Renault's Highland, of the James Renault Museum. Feel free to pose them that way. Uh, we'll be happy to, to work with our speakers for getting answers back to you. We do want to continue the conversation if there's an interest, but I uh, want to thank our panel, and Sarah's going to close us out. Yeah, so thank you, and I'd like to thank you, our audience here in-house, and our audience online, um, as well as really our distinguished panelists for the conversation here this evening. Um, I found it enlightening to hear your thoughts um, from various perspectives um, on this policy statement that has almost lived a life of its own for 200 years. Um, it, is, it inspires us really, I think, to re-examine the United States' interaction with foreign powers, including our closest neighbors. We see Monroe's long reach of geopolitics and our preservation of the United States and the way that the U.S. has cast itself in, in so many different ways since then regarding protection, intervention, and its role in the world. So thank you all. Thank you for joining us. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.